All right, well, thank you all so much for joining us for Out of the Archives, a look back at the Marshall Plan with the Truman Presidential Library. Two years after VE Day, Europe lay in ruins with its economies devastated and its people facing famine. In a commencement address at Harvard University, Secretary George Marshall called for American assistance in restoring the economic infrastructure of Europe. Western Europe responded favorably and the Truman administration called for legislation. The resulting massive aid package, the biggest of its kind and named for Marshall, provided more than $13 billion in funding for housing, infrastructure, and industry. The story of Europe's post-World War II recovery is often told with numbers. But now, Mark Adams, the education director at the Harry S. Truman Presidential Library and Museum, will share the human side of the story, drawing on the Truman Library's rich archival collection, from drawings by school children to an urn of bloodstained soil to the original audio recording of General Marshall's Harvard commencement speech, will delve into the vault of a stunning collection of artifacts and a fascinating out of the archives experience. Uh, so all, let's see, nearly a hundred of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Mark <laughs> for joining us this afternoon. And Mark, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. Great introduction and um, great to have everybody online this afternoon. I, you know, we're high 80s, so we're, we've got almost 100 people. So I'm going to go straight into my presentation. Um, we're going to do questions at the end, if we may. It's just a little easier to manage that and uh, do the questions that way. I am the education director at the Truman Library, and I've been at the library 26 years. And I've done a presentation for Robert before through this group, so it's great to be back. And I appreciate the invitation. So let's go ahead and get started. I'll get my uh, screen share up here. And as Robert mentioned, this is um, out of the archives, uh, looking back at the Marshall Plan. And the Marshall Plan was passed in April of 1948. So actually this year is we're honoring the 75th anniversary of the passage of the legislation. So as Robert mentioned, the speech was in 47, but it took until the following spring uh, to get the legislation passed through Congress. So we're gonna talk about that part of the story. We are gonna delve into our archives and museum collection here at the Truman Presidential Library and Museum. We have 16 million documents in our archives and about 33,000 museum objects here in the building that I'm working in today at the Truman Library. And we opened in 1957 and Harry Truman worked here for about 15 years. We're only gonna see a handful of those documents in archives today. We're certainly not gonna see 16 million, but we're gonna see a few and a few artifacts as well and some photographs along the way. And some really neat things I think you might not have seen before. So let's go ahead and dig into our topic. And um, thanks again for the invitation. So here's just some of a scattering of some of the objects and artifacts and materials we're gonna look at today. I'm gonna to talk about each of these at length a little bit later on, but just to kind of give you a taster as a kind of an introduction to our program, you see a school children drawing on the top left. We see a handwritten letter by Harry Truman on the bottom left, as I look at the screen. Uh, up on the, in the center of the panel is the legislation itself, the European Recovery Act, as we're gonna talk about it. Nickname the Marshall Plan. On the bottom right, you see a photograph from Greece, which is one of the countries that benefited from the Marshall Plan. And then up on the top right is a green urn that came from the Battle of the Bulge, which is on our museum collection. So you can see archives, photographs, legislation, drawings, artifacts, museum artifacts. So we're going to try and uh, talk about the Marshall Plan through the lens of these different types of artifacts today, which is a different approach to this, but I think you'll find enjoyable. So here's the legislation itself, the one that was in the center panel of that previous uh, slide. And this is what's called the European Recovery Act. As I mentioned, it's April of 1948 when it's ultimately passed. We know that Marshall makes this speech at Harvard, which seems appropriate for a location for your library system today, back in the previous summer in 1947. And I've just summarized on the right, the, 
uh, some of the information that the European Recovery Act was about. Um, in simple terms, it's foreign aid to Europe, but it's done so through the lens of the economy, through the lens of politics, through the lens of trade, um, and also political stability. And so this quote from the Recovery Act to promote world peace and the general welfare, national interest and foreign policy of the United States through economic, financial and other measures to the maintenance of the conditions abroad in which free institutions may survive and consistent with the maintenance and the strength and stability of the United States. So I think it's through the United States lens, but it's to help Europe. So we're gonna dig into some of the disagreements on doing this, both the money and the politics and so on. Um, but this is what the legislation laid out. You can see Harry Truman's signature at the bottom of the document, along with the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate because it's a piece of legislation. So it's not an executive order, it's legislation, and there's appropriations associated with that. And we'll talk about that as well, because it's also a little bit unique, the way the, the, way the money is um, passed out to Europe. It's a little different than you might expect. So let's move in, that's the big picture. So let's move into the program. First thing to think about is why is it called the Marshall Plan? This is, Coming out of the Truman administration, Truman's been in office since April of 1945, after FDR's death in April. And he's got this foreign aid package for Europe all set up, but it bears Marshall's name. So that's the one thing to can think about, is what are the relationship between President Truman? And at this time, Marshall is the Secretary of State. He has whole different offices in Truman's cabinet at different times. But at this time period, in 1947, 1948, he's the Secretary of State. Somebody makes mention that's only two pages of legislation. There's a lot more beneath that. But yes, the legislation itself is two pages. There's four different subcommittees that worked on getting that legislation in place, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. But thank you for noticing that. So this is where we're going to dig into some of the relationship between Harry Truman and George C. Marshall. He's well known as kind of a hero to Marshall, to, to Truman himself. He regards Marshall as what he describes as the greatest living American. And then in this letter, and this, this you can see the, sec, the last page of this particular letter from July the 10th, 1947. So right at that time period, shortly after that Marshall makes that speech at Harvard in June, he writes to his wife, Bess, and in our, our archives collection here at the Truman Library, we have more than 1,300 letters that Harry Truman writes, just to Bess Wallace Truman, some before they're married and the majority of them after they get married in 1919. So she, he says in this letter, and you can see, maybe you can detect the, the cursive writing that it's not that easy to read, but um, the middle paragraph, uh, I've decided to give the whole thing to General Marshall. The worst Republican on the Hill can vote for it if we name it after the general. So let's interpret that a little bit. He's giving the whole thing to Marshall. So he's giving this idea of foreign aid, what ends up being called the Marshall Plan. He's going to give the name to General Marshall. He's going to give him the credit. Why? Well, one, he admires him a lot, talks about him as being the greatest living American. But he also realizes when it comes to Congress, the Republicans, what he describes as the worst Republicans, will still vote for it if it's named after the general, General Marshall, because he has in, held in such great esteem. Now, a quick word on Congress for context. In the 1946 midterms, Truman loses the House and Senate. So He's going to regain them in the 1948 presidential election, which is coming up at the end of the year when we get to the, the point of the legislation here in April of 1948. But in, in 1948, when they're voting on it in April, it's a Congress that's dominated by Republicans in both House and the Senate. So Truman knows he needs Republican support. So that's one factor, Give put Marshall's name on it. And then in this letter to to Bess, I love this sentence. 
had a grand session with Marshall today. He's one fine man. So even to his wife, he's gushing about Marshall. So you can see the regard he holds him, but he also realizes the Republicans um, hold him in such great esteem as well. So that's gonna be helpful to him, he thinks, in getting the legislation passed. Here's a um, photograph of kind of the key people around the table that were really the uh, architects and in fact implementers of the Marshall Plan. You see Harry Truman on the left. This is in the Oval Office in November of 1948. So this is shortly after the election and after the legislation has passed, but as they're starting to enact um, the Marshall Plan aid. And so you see George Marshall there on Truman's left. And then you see Paul Hoffman and Avril Harriman. Those names are not as well known, but they're the two key people that really carry out the Marshall Plan. They run the Economic Cooperation Administration and they're discussing the logistics of the plan there in that photograph. And they're the, the key people around the table. And then on the left, we're going back a little bit to the speech that Marshall made in uh, Harvard in June of 1947. And this is where it's interesting because the speech is not actually, you know, a wonderful speech in terms of oratory or he's not banging on the podium. It's quite a quiet speech. Some people thought it was kind of boring, but the message within it, the words within it are kind of earth shattering. Um, and so he's describing the situation in Europe, post-World War II, Europe is in ruins. The economy is in bad shape. And he feels like it's in the middle paragraph that it's logical that the United States should do whatever it is able to assist in the return of normal economic health. So that's part of it. But then the next part of that sentence, without much, there can be no political stability and no assured peace. So here we are two years after Germany surrenders in May of 1945, just two years later, we're talking about there's no assured peace, there's no political stability. And then Marshall finishes this particular section. Our policy is directed not towards any country or doctrine, but against hunger, poverty, desperation, and chaos. Now, Marshall has been to Europe. He's visited Europe. He's really shocked by the conditions there. Truman has visited Europe. He was there in 1945 for the Potsdam Conference and toured Germany. So they're both very well aware of the conditions in Europe. But here we are two years later, and they're still describing the economic ruin, the infrastructure, the breakdown of the industry, threats to currency. And even more importantly, and it maybe doesn't get talked about enough, the political instability and the threat of communism in countries like France and Italy. So there is a political component to this as well. And I'm sure that's what the four gentlemen in the photograph are talking about in terms of implementing the program. So this is another photograph of Marshall and Truman. This one's in November of 47, and they're at the airport in Washington, DC. As Marshall is making frequent trips to Europe to negotiate with the what we call the Conference of Foreign Ministers. So those foreign ministers around Europe. Now, what Marshall calls for in his speech is not so much aid pushed on Europe by the United States, but for cooperation for the 16 European countries as it ends up being, um, to come together to help form the plan. So it's not a plan that's forced upon the European nations, but the European nations need to buy in and they need to formulate their part of the plan as well. So that's, that's why it's a little bit different in nature. So he's meeting quite frequently with the foreign ministers in Europe as the legislation is being formed, as that's going forward. So two things are happening. Marshall makes his speech. He then goes to Europe to negotiate with the European countries. In the meantime, Truman is now working on Congress for the legislation, as, you, as we've talked about, that doesn't get passed until the following April, which actually in today's terms seems quite quick, but it's almost a year uh, since his speech before he gets the legislation through. So much so that in this fall, in the November and December, they actually pass a separate age package, separate aid package to some of the European countries because they're in so much ruin. 
and they send about $500 million over as just a separate piece of foreign aid in the fall of 1947 as kind of a stopgap measure. So the money's already flowing, but the Marshall Plan money is gonna look a little different. And then um, this is another letter from Truman to his wife. We do have a lot of them. I mentioned we have more than 1,300, but he doesn't talk about policy issues that much. So when we have the opportunity, we take the chance to use those in our presentations. And again, you can see part of the letter over on the left, the, the, um, the, trans the transcript is on the right. And I just focused on three small paragraphs. Back in March of 47, Truman has started the Truman Doctrine, which was initially to support Greece and Turkey. So that's some context for this letter. But that forms the Truman Doctrine where Truman is going to protect democracies around the world. So he says in his letter to Bess, we withdraw from Greece and Turkey and prepare for war. It just must not happen. So he's committed to the aid he's given to Greece and Turkey. In um, the spring of 1947, incidentally, $400 million was given to Greece and Turkey in aid through the Truman Doctrine. And then it says, to feed France and Italy this winter will cost 580 million. That's the legislation, that's the aid that's just been passed uh, that, that September. And then he says the Marshall Plan proposals are gonna cost $16.5 billion. So a huge difference, 16.5 billion for the Marshall Plan. Now he says, importantly, and I'll explain why, the 16.5 is for a four year period and is for peace. If we don't do it, he's predicting a Russian war would cost us 400 billion and untold lives, mostly civilian. So I must do what I can. I shouldn't write you this stuff, but you should know what I've been dealing with, I've been facing with since Potsdam. And Potsdam is the conference in uh, July of 1945, when he met with Stalin and Churchill after the German surrender right before he dropped the atomic bomb in August. And what he's meaning by that, what he's been facing since Potsdam is really resistance from Stalin and the growth of communist influence in Eastern Europe in 1946 and 1947. And the speech by Winston Churchill about the Iron Curtain was in the March of 1946. And he's got his Truman Doctrine speech himself in March of 1947. So all of this is going on. Now he does say the 16.5 is for a four year period. So what happens is with this legislation that we saw the first two pages of, they do a smaller amount. They don't ask for 16.5 billion right off the bat. They ask for about 6 billion approximately for the first 15 months. And then they come back for subsequent appropriations. And that's one strategy and tactic that helps the legislation get passed because they're not asking for this huge 16.5 right off the bat. They're gonna come back in a year or in 15 months and ask for subsequent appropriations. Well, if the plan is going wrong and the money's not being spent correctly, Congress can refuse those appropriations. So it's a little bit of a gamble on, on Truman's behalf in a way, because he's not getting all the money in the outset, but he also realizes that this is a way to win over Congress and they're not spending all of that money. So it's he's buying a car for 16.5 billion over four years instead of putting all of it down as one down payment, if you'll excuse my analogy. And that, but that does help politically get the legislation through amongst other things. So let's go back and let's talk a little bit more about Congress itself, because this is incredibly important. One thing to remember, uh, from your history books, I suppose, is that Truman was a senator for 10 years. He was elected as the senator from Missouri in 1934, and then he becomes vice president after the 1944 presidential election as Truman's as uh, Roosevelt's running mate, and is inaugurated as vice president in January of 1945, and then ultimately president in April after FDR's death. So he has been in the Senate for 10 years. So that he, has, he has good relations across the Senate. He's been in charge of committees. He's been behind legislation. <clears throat> and he has friends on both sides of the aisle. So that's going to be in his favor. However, many congressmen, particularly Republicans, are against this type of huge amount of in aid to uh, Europe when the money could be spent elsewhere. Does that sound familiar? Every decade, we have the same 
not necessarily Europe, maybe Ukraine right now might be a good example, maybe Africa, the third world, other places, the United States has helped with aid. Similar arguments, uh, we see those parallels. So we're gonna look at Congress. And in this case, I've gone a little bit different. We've gone to political cartoons. And that's because they're my favorite. <laughs> Full disclosure, in our archives, I love looking at our political cartoons. You really get a sense of the time period and you get a sense of the opposition. This one is from Clifford Berryman, which was in the Washington Evening Star, prolific cartoonist. This is in November of 1947. So as they're getting closer and closer to looking at the legislation, and you can see here, Truman's got his fingers in his ears. He's reading a document that says special session and foreign aid, but Congressman Knutson is over on the right saying tax reduction, tax reduction, and he's banging his drum. So, you know, different, different things needed from Congress. Congress is talking about tax reduction, obviously, and Truman wants this special session of foreign aid, which means spending money. So I imagine the tax reduction may be more difficult. So that's one really nice one that you can see some opposition to what Truman's wanting to do. And then here's another one, and this is for the special session of Congress where they're looking at different things. And look at all of these. This is kind of um, pawns on a chess set. You can see the chessboard on the bottom. They're supposed to be pawns. He's a better cartoonist than me, so I'm not complaining. They're going into this special session. You see the gentleman with the briefcase on the right, Congress. And in this special session, look at all of these things they're considering. Quick aid to Europe, price control at home, long range Marshall Plan, aid to China, aid to South America. What I found interesting, out just as a little aside, this is November of 1947. They're already calling it the Marshall Plan. So the speech was in June. The legislation isn't passed until April of 48, but we're already referring to it as the Marshall Plan. So you can see the wheels are in motion there. And then other, other expenses too, aid to China, aid to South America, aid to your quick aid to Europe. So a different, different one, which we just talked about. And then Congress, but I didn't know you were bringing all the relatives, which, you know, he's brought all these other things along. And that means more and more expense, right? If you have to deal with all of these, more, more feet at the table for maybe Thanksgiving. We're in November when this cartoon is, is written. So another interesting way of looking at some of the opposition Congress might have. And then Truman makes a special message to Congress in December of 1947, so right before Christmas. He makes an address, a message to Congress, and he's talking about the free nations of Europe to restore their lives, to restore the sound world economy, uh, support for ideals of liberty and justice. So we're intertwining the economy, you know, standard of living, rebuilding Europe, but also politics, individual liberty and justice. I think between the lines, he's saying that's not happening in the Soviet Union. Um, as we give them moral support, that's gonna give them the chance to, you know, pay that back through teamwork, the cooperation from both home and abroad. So this idea of a cooperative plan that the 16 nations have to help form the plan of how the aid is gonna be spent, where is it gonna be spent? So not all fighting over the money. So he really reiterates the fact that this is a joint undertaking between the two bodies of Europe and the United States. There's also some political motivation there too for kind of getting Europe to be more unified itself so that the countries come together. We've just had two wars, World War I, World War II, where Europe was split in two. So the idea here is to try and get Europe to be more unified around the economy, trade, ultimately currency, but not yet. But we know that's coming in the 50s and ultimately the common market and the European Union down the road. And he says, I want you to proceed as rapidly, rapidly as possible. So we're ready for this by April the 1st. Well, spoiler alert, the legislation passes on April the 3rd. So Truman gets his, gets his way, but it is not an easy task by any means. Here's the legislation when it's passed in April. One thing that people may not realize is that um, 
various supporters of Truman go all around the country um, promoting this, going to um, social groups, Kiwanis groups, lion clubs, lions clubs, you name the group, different people were going out um, to visit different clubs all around the country making speeches. Um, more than 100 congressmen make trips to Europe to see the situation in Europe and then report back. They form four subcommittees, uh, one through the House, and then the other three are bipartisan, um, both House and Senate members, that report on different aspects of the implementation of the plan. And they include Republicans in every one of them. And they come back unanimously in favor of the plan and how it's going to be implemented. What Truman's strongest ally and George Marshall's strongest ally was a Republican, Senator Arthur Vandenberg, who really pushes this pushes this through um, to help get it through Congress in April. Here's the signing of the legislation. Mostly happy faces. There's always some glum ones. Maybe that's just the way they look. But this is Truman signing the legislation there on April 3rd, 1948, 75 years ago this year, back in April. And so how does Europe react? Of course, they're very grateful. I've got a couple of examples of artifacts I wanted to share with you. This one predates the Marshall Plan, but it's a good example of the type of materials that we have in our archives of Grateful Europe. So this particular um, urn comes from Belgium. It's made of jade green malachite, as it says there. And it's got coats of arms of various towns in Belgium uh, for, that were involved in the war in Europe, the Second World War, and in particular from the Battle of the Bulge, which is probably one of the most well-known Second World War battles. Uh, it contains soil, which has blood from American soldiers who fought in the Battle of the Bulge in an urn inside of this um, case that I mentioned. This was hand carried to Truman by American and Belgian soldiers and presented to him in 1946. So prior to the Marshall Plan, but certainly an incredible example of gratitude from Europe. And you can see some of the town names on the coats of arms there, on the case that's inside. And then this is the black item on the left is the urn and then the, the soil from the Battle of the Bulge is inside of that urn. These are some uh, drawings, paintings done by German school children. Um, to thank Truman for the school feeding program. Um, the, the statistics about the school feeding program are there. You can see them, how they um, started out feeding 240 children and to fill, feeding 820,000 children, a 350 calorie meal, five days a week. And you see on this poster or drawing that Bavarian students entered a competition um, to design a poster to thank President Truman. And so in our collection, in our museum, we have the top 50 out of the, I think it was about a half a million posters that were made by German children thanking Truman. And you can see the, the ship there with the stars and stripes and then the planes and then the different architecture from the United States over to Europe. And I think I've got another example of those. There's another one. I can't read the German writing, I'm afraid, but you can see the skyscrapers on the left. And then in this case, it's sailboats. That's not really how they transported, of course, but student imagination. And you can see them loaded up with goods coming across the Atlantic and then them stepping foot in Europe when they come over to the right side. So these Truman was really enamored by these posters and we have them on display in our museum that we just recently renovated. So a wonderful artifact to show gratitude from, uh, in this case, uh, German children. And then on display, how did they, just to show you some examples of um, gra both gratitude and also the implementation. This is a photograph from the National Archives. Um, watch it, this is in Yugoslavia as it was known then. Um, this is Yugoslavs watching a boat coming from Greece which was, its, which was the boat's first stopping point. A flower that came in um, from Salonika, uh, arrived in Salonika, Greece from Texas. Uh, and then, it, then part of that shipment then went on to uh, 
to Greece. Yugoslavia was the reason I use this one. Yugoslavia is actually technically not part of the Marshall Plan, but they actually received a separate $69 million uh, aid program from the United States. And you can see the, the waiting faces as they're waiting for the first shipment to arrive of flour from Texas to Greece to Turkey. Excuse me, Yugoslavia, apologize. This is a kind of a symbolic photograph of this tank that comes in to France. And you can see why I'm showing you this. The caption on the is one millionth ton for France. Now, the issue here is that most of the aid was foodstuffs and things like that. But military equipment, industrial equipment was certainly part of this too. In fact, one of the reasons they got more and more European cooperation was this idea of mutual defense which manifests itself in 1949 and an organization that's very much in the news today. In 1949, Truman helped form NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And most historians agree that the forerunner of NATO was through the Marshall Plan as they started to give military aid and military assurance, ultimately leading to the NATO treaties of 1949. So there's certainly um, a legacy there of the Marshall Plan in terms of the formation of NATO. And we see NATO at the forefront of the news today, particularly with the situation in Ukraine. And then in our museum and library collection, we have this incredible book. It doesn't look like it from the cover, so bear with me. But here we see this book called The Marshall Plan at the Midmark. So I mentioned before, um, they had to go to Congress every year or in the first case, 15 months, and then after that, every 12 months, to get additional appropriations. So they would come up with these reports that they would present to Congress showing the progress of the Marshall Plan. Here you see Paul Hoffman in the middle, who's the director of the plan, Dean Acheson on the left, and then George Marshall himself on the right. And they've got this book, but I am very fortunate to have been able to scan some of the interior pages. And so you can see this is one of the inter interior pages and some of these statistics are astonishing. So it's talking about um, halfway through the Marshall Plan, coal production has risen 17%, steel production 52%, electrical power, cement production, cotton yard, cotton yarn production, grain production, sugar, meat, milk, fats, oils. This is all in Europe. So they're not only providing aid and money and, and so forth, but they've also helped regain the agricultural and industrial um, strengths that Europe has uh, during that time. We're gonna to get to the question about those refuse the Marshall Plan at the end, if I may, I do see your question. Here's a here kind of leads into this map. So thank you for that segue. These are the countries that received aid. Those are those shaded in green and gray, and you see the flags there. And those countries in white are those that did not. So let's maybe answer that question now. The aid was offered to the Soviet Union and to those Eastern Bloc countries. And in, some, in fact, some of those Eastern Bloc countries like Czechoslovakia, as it was called then, now the Czech Republic today, uh, were very willing and wanting to take the aid. But because of the control uh, by Stalin uh, of those Eastern European countries, uh, Stalin refused that aid, would not let them take the money. And they set up their own economic aid package coming out of Moscow, which was a complete failure. So you can see those Eastern European countries. You'll see Spain too is left off this. And that's because the uh, associations with Franco and the disputes over the Spanish Civil War had left tensions between the rest of Europe and Spain. And so money was not offered there. But you can see some of the defeated nations, Germany and Italy, for example, were both offered aid and received aid. Now, when I say Germany, it's the Western zones. Germany was divided into those four zones um, at the Potsdam Conference. So the Western zones, what became West Germany in 1949, received aid through the Marshall Plan, as did Italy. Here's some of the interior pages, and these are just showing some examples. Um, so you can see on the left there, Manchester dock workers unloading a US ship. Um, flour from Higginsville, Missouri, just down the road from where I am in Independence, a flower going to Greece, um, a lady moving into a new house, new house in Copenhagen, Denmark, 
and then uh, weaving cotton in France, and then the architect there on the bottom right. I think that got cut off, but I believe that's in the Netherlands. And then here's one of my favorite photographs, and it kind of summarizes the Marshall Plan in one photograph. And this is a Missouri mule alongside a Greek myrrh, and they're plowing a field in Greece. So Missouri mules were sent from Missouri by President Truman through the Marshall Plan to help with agriculture. Truman used mules himself as a farmer, as a young man. And here you see the cooperation that I was talking about between Europe and United States. So let's just uh, move on. Here you see a kind of before and after of um, a, Be a Belgian metalworks that's inside the book that I mentioned, kind of from its destruction on the left to its re rehabilitation and back up into working order on the right. And then there was so much uh, appreciation for the Marshall Plan, or as we call it, the Economic Recovery Program, that in Italy, they held exhibits to promote it. And this is the exterior of the exhibit. You see the ERP there, for an exhibit that was held in 1949. And then interior, you see these posters, food, coal, oil, cotton displays with the flour and the coal and the oil drums. So this is the interior, one of the slides of the interior of that exhibit. And then my conclusion, we have about, whoops, sorry about that. Press too many buttons at once. I wanna make sure I have time for questions, but I do wanna to get to my conclusion too. And my mouse is, here we go. So as you can imagine, this was an incredibly bold program. Most expensive initiative ever attempted. As I mentioned, 16.5 16, 16 billion in today's dollars. Changes with inflation every day, of course, but it's about $170 billion in today's money. Um, not only did it stop any kind of economic depression, which people worried about, it also paves the way for political independence in those countries that were threatened by communism. And that was not, that was not unintended. They were very worried, particularly, um, there was elections in 1948 in Italy, um, where it looked like the communists were gonna win. And there's a lot of speculation that the CIA helped that election go a different direction. So that's something you can look into. They were very worried about the spread of further communism from Eastern Europe into Western Europe. But it also not only did it um, avert the threat of economic depression, it rebuilt industry, it rebuilt agriculture in, in Europe, across Europe, but it also paid for these kinds of um, cooperative efforts. So the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, um, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, I mentioned, and ultimately the European Union. That started out more as kind of a cooperation of um, countries that produce steel and coal, and they kind of united around that. And then as they went into the 50s, they started what we call the common market. And then that developed in the 1970s and 80s more into how we see the European Union today. So certainly a legacy. And then the bullet points there on the right, the idea of America being isolated like they were prior to World War I, that idea is over. Europe, Europe is being assisted by America. America's got the foot in Europe and people are critical of that. And others are supportive of that. It's a true example of the containment policy that Truman held as part of his foreign policy, part of the Truman Doctrine, containing communism, not letting it spread. The idea of rebuilding your enemy is fairly unique at that time. So, you know, get your enemy, instead of reparations after World War I, has the idea of rebuilding your enemy and bringing them back to an equal footing. It's been regarded as, you know, a huge, great humanitarian effort. And you see that phrase, used Marshall Plan for Africa, Marshall Plan for AIDS, Marshall Plan for South America. Diff the Marshall Plan is used as a bellwether, as an example of a successful policy. And USAID, foreign aid programs, came out of that concept. On the flip side, the Soviets in particular, uh, and some critics in the United States, 
accused the United States of engaging in economic imperialism. So influencing these countries to kind of come around to your way of thinking through economic aid. So this idea of imperialism through economics was a criticism that was made. So let me stop my screen sharing and get the chat back up. And you are welcome to um, start to write your questions on the chat while I take the questions uh, that you have posed. And somebody asked about um, how much is that in today's dollars? So we got that one. And Mark, uh, just as a heads up, uh, only you and I can see the comments and the questions. Okay. So just make sure to so read I'll them read aloud those. before you answer them. Yeah, so James asked uh, how many years was the 30 billion spread? It was spread over four years. And then I think I answered how much is that? It was 16 billion. Um, and then it was not 13. And it was over four years. And that's about 168 to 170 million, depending on the inflation of the day <laughs> and, and whether you compare that to the euro or something like that. Uh, 16 nations. Do you have a pencil? I can read through them real quick. I just happen to have a chart to my left, so I haven't memorized them. But uh, the United Kingdom, Italy, the Netherlands, Greece, Austria, Belgium, Luxembourg, France, West Germany. Hopefully you weren't counting. <laughs> yeah, Ireland did receive aid. It's kind of very similar to Yugoslavia. There were countries that received aid that were not necessarily part of the plan. Yeah, the aid to Asia was separate, but there was aid to Asia. There's, and there's also aid to South America to, through something called the Point Four program. So there's different aid around the world. Um, but the Marshall Plan specifically was for European countries. But there was aid to Japan and there was aid to South America. And that the South American aid comes under what we call the Point Four program, which happens more in Truman's second term um, after the 48 election victory. Uh, what do the European countries need to do to receive the money? Well, they did have to kind of sign off. They had to kind of come together cooperatively. Um, those 16 nations came together to form the plan with Marshall of how the money was going to be implemented. And there were, I won't go through all the details, but there were some restrictions on how the money could be spent. They actually put in a proposal. Think of it like a grant proposal. Uh, you write a grant, you ask for the money, and then it comes back and then they oversee that. However, it's important, they mostly were not grants. They were, they, they were, they were, they were grants, not loans. So you didn't have to pay them back. I think my numbers might be a little off. 95 to 98% of the money was given and didn't have to be paid back. However, they did have to match dollar for dollar um, that money. So when they say you're, say you're a country and you got a million dollars, you had to match that in your own country. Um, and what the different countries did that in different ways. So the United Kingdom, where I'm from, um, has put the money to reduce the debt that they had in the United Kingdom government. Other countries put it into funds to spend on other projects, but they had to fund that up. Now in um, Austria and in Germany, some of that Marshall Plan money that they put in as matching funds still exists today. They're still spending that money, which is kind of remarkable. So it has a real legacy in terms of the infrastructure programs and things like that. I like the comment about the, the Belgian chocolate in the green box. <laughs> Any other questions? And thank you for the kind comments there too. Just so you don't have to read them out loud, Mark, I'll, I'll read the kind comments. Uh, Janice, says <laughs> thank, uh, Janice says, thanks for this great presentation. Steve says, fantastic lecture, very informative. Frank says, bravo, superb, concise, and historically relevant. Uh, absolutely see. relevant for sure absolutely relevant and we've had quite an amazing week but but um yeah uh joyce i, I apologize you might have already answered this joyce wanted to know who were the countries who refused the marshall plan so mostly it was the eastern european countries and because of stalin's influence right so they what some of them actually wanted the money uh, in march of 1948 the czech government was overthrown by the soviets 
So they were ready to accept the money and then suddenly they were a puppet state of the Soviet Union. So those right. puppet states, as we call them, were not allowed, even if they wanted the money, they were not allowed to take it. And, and Stalin actually set up a separate economic aid plan in kind of retaliation, um, but it didn't really work in the same way. Gotcha. Uh, Maddie says, outstanding. Claudia says, this was excellent. I don't see any additional questions. Uh, we're early, Mark, but that's okay with me. So folks, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Mark for a wonderful presentation. Mark, I'll circle back to you in about 30 seconds. Uh, but folks, just a reminder for those watching live, you'll receive an email from me tomorrow with a feedback survey. Please take 30 seconds and fill that out. Uh, also, there'll be a recording. There'll be information about some other uh, US presidential uh, programs that might be of interest. Uh, and I'll also thank the partnering libraries uh, in that email. Uh, Mark, do you have any last words before we wrap it up? Uh, just if any, and we had people from all over the country and Canada and everywhere else, if anyone's in the Kansas City area, I really encourage you to come to our brand new renovated museum. We just finished a $30 million renovation. You can see that Belgian urn. You can see those uh, children's drawings of the, um, of the aid packages, the gratitude paint paintings, amongst many other things to deal with Truman's life and presidency. So if you're in the Kansas City area, please come visit. Incidentally, that book, The um, Marshall Plan of the Midmark, it's all been digitized and the whole thing is online on our website. All right, good to know. All right, Mark, well, thank you all so much. I thank you all for watching. I hope everyone enjoys uh, the 4th of July and uh, we'll see you soon. So thanks so much, Mark. Thank you. Bye-bye.